Meine Damen und Herren, herzlich willkommen zu einer weiteren Ausgabe unserer Fachtagung online, der Webseminarserie des Fachverbands Pflanzenkohle. Heute mit einer Premiere, mit einem unserem ersten englischsprachigen Vortrag, auf den ich mich persönlich sehr, sehr freue. Aber üblich möchte ich mich kurz, äh, kurz äh, vorstellen, mich und den Fachverband Pflanzenkohle. Mein Name ist Nikolaus Hagemann, ich bin ba Mitglied im Vorstand, als Beisitzer im Vorstand des Fachverbands Pflanzenkohle. Wir sehen heute für den Moment Pflanzenkohle für mich, aber wie üblich möchte ich auch vorstellen, die, äh, die ganze Mannschaft, die in, diesen, in diesem Seminar äh, steckt und die vielen anderen Dinge des Fachverbands Pflanzenkohle organisiert, sowohl unserem ehrenamtlichen Vorstand, als auch äh, unseren, unserem Team der Verwaltung und der Öffentlichkeitsarbeit. Und dieses Team können wir auch durch die Deutsche Postcode Lotterie äh, mit am Leben erhalten und eben solche Projekte wie äh, diese Webseminarserie hier durchführen. Oder eben auch unser aktuell größtes Projekt, die Übersetzung von äh, to Cool the Earth, wo wir gerade mitten im Fachlektorat äh, stecken. Auch das wird durch die Deutsche Postcode Lotterie ähm, gefördert. Wie üblich der Hinweis auf die verschiedenen Kanäle, über die man informiert bleiben kann und über die wir unsere Neuigkeiten verbreiten, sei es Facebook, Instagram, Instagram oder auch YouTube, wo Sie auch mittlerweile einige ähm, der vergangenen Webseminare nachhören und nachsehen können, wenn, wenn Sie die verpasst haben. And now, uh, switch to English, that also our guest today, uh, Kathleen Draper, can, uh, can understand what we are Uh, talk what I'm telling about her. Uh, Kathleen, it's a great pleasure to have you here in our German Biochar Association uh, web seminar. You'll talk today about dwelling on drawdown constructions with biochar. And now a few words uh, on, on Kathleen. She is the owner of Finger Lakes Biochar, which focuses on biochar activities in New York, New York State. And at the same time, she's my colleague at Itaka Institute because she's our director um, for the US, and uh, as most of you know, Itaca Institute has a global focus on biochar activities. She has been deeply involved in many areas of biochar uh, research, education, and uh, consulting with companies um, that are new and start up in the biochar field. Um, Kathleen is also uh, the, um, the board chair of the International Biochar Initiative and the vice chair of the US Biochar Initiative. So. Uh, many stages uh, where she's um, that keeps uh, keep her busy. Um, she's also the co-author of the book that uh, many of us are uh, just working right now. It's uh, "Burn Using Fire to Cool the Earth," but also she's working on on the new book "Terra Preta: How the World's Most Fertile Soil Can Help Reverse Climate Change and Reduce World Hunger." Uh, that being said, without um, further ado, I would like to. You, I think you're second. Yes, and then I'm. Yeah, very curious. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Guten Tag und vielen Dank, dass Sie mich eingeladen haben, heute mit Ihnen zu sprechen. Sorry, but that is the extent of my German, and I would like to thank Google Translate for assisting me with that. Uh, if I speak start speaking too quickly, just please tell me in the chat to slow down. I'm going to um, take myself off video. Hopefully that will make things a little clearer because, Nicolas, you are a little um, scrambled on my end. So I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all today. And I'd also like to thank you for sponsoring the translation of Burn. Both Albert and I are thrilled to know it will be available in German, especially as we both consider Germany to be on the cutting edge when it comes to biochar. And, and I will say that Albert offered to wear his Ladenhosen if you would like to have him come speak to you at some point in the future. So just a little bit more background for those of you that don't meet, know me already. I've been involved in the biochar world for the better part of a decade. And as Nicola said, I wear a wide variety of hats in the biochar world, which has allowed me to have a fairly broad and somewhat unique perspective on this still young but increasingly essential industry. 
The first biochar hat that I donned was after I completed a master's in sustainable management where I wrote my thesis on small scale replicable biochar production. And I launched Finger Lakes Biochar very, very naively, I confess. But nowadays, Finger Lakes Biochar is focused on research, education, and consulting, mostly within New York State. Most recently, I've been working with Cornell University on the use of biochar on dairy farms and also with the Rochester Institute of Technology on using biochar uh, from food waste in different types of composites. As Nicholas said, I am part of the Ethica Institute, started by my colleague Hans-Peter Schmidt, whom you all know is a true pioneer in the industry. And he's a real inspiration when it comes to the topic of this presentation. So as the, as the current chair of the IBI board, I'm fortunate to see and hear about some of the huge opportunities and hurdles facing the industry. And the pace of change within this industry has begun to change exponentially over the past 12 months or so. Most recently, I and a few colleagues have launched a new startup called Centrist, which is looking at designing a variety of different composites for the packaging and building industries. The topic I'll be talking about is near and dear to my heart and something I've been thinking about and learning about for the better part of two years as I've been planning and building what I call my dwelling on drawdown. It's my own personal carbon sink sanctuary. I've been looking at the building and construction industry at both a personal and professional level. And I see this as a huge opportunity to reimagine and refashion an industry responsible for emitting an outsized share of greenhouse gas emissions into one that could not only reduce to zero, but could potentially create vast new carbon sink opportunities using biochar. One of the very few negative emissions technologies that is safe, scalable, and shovel ready. And just as a point, uh, this is a picture from yesterday of my sea sink sanctuary with three of the remaining super sacks of biochar that I've been using on the project. What I hope to cover in the next little while is a discussion of a few terms to set the context for the presentation, including decarbonization, as well as embodied and operational carbon. Next, I'll discuss a high level, at a high level, the impact of the construction industry on climate change and where the sources of those emissions are concentrated, where they can start reducing them, and where carbon sinks can be created. I'll review some of the current bar biochar markets for industrial uses, particularly focusing on the building and construction industry. And then I'll talk a little bit about my own experiences with trying to build a carbon sequestering home. I don't know if this is true in the German speaking world, but the word of the decade seems to be decarbonization. Companies and countries are all about that these days. But personally, I'm not a fan of this word at all because it's confusing, or at the very least, it's imprecise. It makes carbon into the enemy, which is ridiculous, as carbon is the source of life, or at least one of them anyway. The real focus should be on swapping out our use of ancient carbon for what I like to call adolescent carbon or photosynthetic carbon. When I use the term carbon optimization, this is what I'm talking about. And I confess, I still get backed into the corner and I use the term decarbonization. But in reality, I'm talking about displacing paleo carbon with plant carbon. One other set of terms that you may already know well, but for those that don't, I think it's important to understand the difference between embodied carbon, that is the sum of all the energy required to produce any goods or service. So mining, harvesting, processing, manufacturing, transportation, and installation. So for that panel of drywall, it includes all the energy used to mine the gypsum, transport it to the factory, the energy used to produce it, and then transport it to the retail store and to the customer and to install it, and even the energy and emissions related to its end of life. Operational carbon 
focuses on the energy used after a home or a building is completed and for the rest of its functional life of 25 or 75 years. Specifically, that includes the energy needed to keep the lights on and control indoor climate, even if it's at the expense of the outdoor climate. There are many ways to slice up accountability for greenhouse gas emissions, but by any measure, the construction industry's climate impact is huge. It accounts for an estimated 36% of energy use globally. It's higher than that in the US, 40%, and nearly 40% of all carbon dioxide emissions. Those emissions can be divided into 28% operational carbon and 11% embodied carbon. At the moment, there are many organizations in the construction trade, a few of which I've mentioned here, that are keenly focused on reducing operational carbon to net zero by improving energy efficiency, switching to renewables, and offsetting any remainder. Far fewer organizations seem to be focusing on the embodied carbon in building materials. Considering the very, very short time frame the IPCC says we have to reduce emissions and rebalance carbon, the focus on emissions generated now for construction materials would seem to be something we should be concentrating on with a high degree of urgency. This is a key area where I think biochar can play a pivotal role in going beyond net zero. This industry can not only provide multiple carbon sink opportunities, but it can, and in fact, it already is providing a source of feedstock for making biochar. To paraphrase Sir Isaac Newton, what goes up must come down and buildings are no exception to this third law of motion. The amount of demolition debris combined with the unused construction material in new construction and debris from land clearing for construction is staggering. More than half a billion tons per year. Wood waste makes up a good portion of that waste stream. And while some markets for the cleaner wood waste such as dimensional lumbers, trees felled during construction, and in some cases, pallets have been developed. The construction and demolition recycling industry is definitely on the hunt for larger and higher value markets. A few have already entered the biochar industry in the United States, largely to help them efficiently reduce the volume of wood waste through the use of systems such as Tiger Cat's Carbonator, which you can see in the bottom corner there. This system can convert 10 tons per hour of wood waste into one ton of biochar. Recently, the Construction and Demolition Recycling Association has begun funding biochar research to determine if and how biochar can help the industry manage another one of their waste streams, gypsum fimes which are the small pieces of drywall, which is also called wallboard or plasterboard. These finds are often used as what's called alternative daily cover at landfills. But that's something that's coming under increased, increased scrutiny as these finds generate significant amounts of hydrogen sulfide, a flammable gas, which can lead to health and safety concerns, as well as that rotten egg smell that we all love to hate. Blending biochar with the gypsum fines has been shown to attenuate or weaken the ability for hydrogen sulfide to form, meaning that the industry can continue to send their gypsum fines to the landfills. This is still not the ideal scenario, in my opinion, but until we start making wallboard out of biochar, or at least something more sustainable and less damaging, that's the solution of choice within the industry right now. I see carbonization of construction debris as a large growth opportunity, especially as landfills close and are choosier in terms of what materials are allowed to be landfilled. Imagine being able to provide carbonization services on site, eliminating transportation, and then using the biochar on site in any number of ways, which I'll discuss soon. I should note that there are many types of wood composites that have glues and other potentially toxic chemicals of concern. So care must be taken with any of these materials before any wholesale recommendations to carbonize is given.
Carbon sinks, as you no doubt know, are gaining huge attention these days, ever since the IPCC noted in their 2018 special report that reducing, reducing emissions is no longer sufficient to avert climate chaos. As an industry, I think it's important for us to understand biochar's relative standing amidst other potential sinks. I'm sure you know this already, but I still see it often said that biochar pulls carbon out of the air. Just this week, in fact, there was a new biochar-based product that came out of the Pratt Institute, a well-known design college claiming that very thing. As we all should know, plants do that part, and the biochar can act to prevent it from converting back into carbon dioxide and raise, rising into the atmosphere, what I like to call carbon interruptus. Biochar is still a carbon sink, but it plays a different role in the carbon cycle than some other carbon sinks. And unlike some of the technical carbon removal technologies recommended by the IPCC and others, putting biochar in the ground or in building materials often offers benefits beyond just carbon sequestration. So I view at least two pathways for biochar to help the construction industry with carbon optimization. The first way is to displace high embodied carbon materials, of which there are plenty, with lower embodied carbon materials, or preferably those that are net negative or carbon positive and that they store more carbon than they took to manufacture, transport, and use. The second sink opportunity is to utilize biochar around the buildings in hardscape or so-called softscape or what most people call landscape and in water management related uses. These can all provide enormous sink opportunities. The notion of using biochar in buildings is still quite new and novel. The first well-documented use of it that I'm aware of is by my colleague, Hans-Peter Schmidt, who tested it in the plaster in his wine cellar. The benefits to adding biochar went well beyond banking carbon in this scenario. Improved humidity control, adsorption of toxins, electromagnetic shielding are but a few of those benefits. Since that initial foray into real world piloting, the academic community has conducted more research on its use in concrete, mortar, and asphalt. Additional benefits include improved insulation, fire resistance, compression strength, flexural strength, and biochar can act as a curing accelerator. All of this depends on the types of biochar, the mixing recipes, and the intended end use of the composite. But with the right combinations, biochar can be used extensively to the extent that buildings could become net sequestering. Since the first pioneering efforts, many, many DIYers, that's do-it-yourselfers, and I include myself here, have explored blending biochar in bricks, concrete, and other composites using different kinds of binders, including recycled plastics, resins, and some more exotic materials. A few intrepid entrepreneurs are beginning to move into this space and eagerly looking for investment capital. You may know of the one in Germany, a startup called Made of Air. They're making a construction material for building exteriors and furniture out of biochar-based thermoplastics. In 2020, a major U.S. flooring company announced a carpet tile backing product made using biochar. This is a multinational company that has been working quietly for the past few years to determine if they can replace calcium carbonate with biochar how that impacts the embodied carbon, and whether they can source sufficient quantities of high quality biochar in different areas of the world where they have their manufacturing facilities. This sort of product has the potential to create enormous demand for biochar. There are a few other companies at early stages of development that have prototyped biochar-based composite lumber, which you can see in the middle there, uh, cinder blocks, and one that I'm especially interested in, carbon foam for insulation. The research has proven that biochar can replace high embodied carbon products 
such or ingredients such as carbon black, a fossil fuel derived ingredient often used to dye materials black and other common fillers such as calcium carbonate, a mine substance used in plastics, or as I mentioned, carpet backing or sand, which is heavily used in concrete. One of my IBI board colleagues, Harn Waipua, an MIT PhD working in Singapore, has been investigating the use of biochar in concrete and mortar for several years now. And he's on the cusp of publishing information on what characteristics of biochar are best suited for use in concrete, used for different purposes. Once this type of information is accepted, methodologies for carbon removal credits using biochar in construction materials can be developed, which will promote carbon financing to support rehabilitation of national and international infrastructure. When you compare these vast carbon storage opportunities, which provide enhanced construction materials with the notion of injecting CO2 into the Earth's crevices solely to rebalance carbon with no additional co-benefits, it should be clear where we should be spending our time, attention, and funding. Hardscape, unsurprisingly, refers to inanimate landscape materials that are, well, hard, such as paved roads, driveways, walls, walkways, and other elements made from concrete, asphalt, stone, and even wood. Low quality biochar made from things like municipal solid waste may not be something you necessarily want to put in soils used for growing food. However, adding it to asphalt could be an excellent idea as it could not only sequester carbon, but other heavy metals that are concentrated in the biochar. As you may have heard from my webinar last year with Andre Von Zeele of Carbon Core, adding variable amounts and types of biochar can improve certain qualities of cold mix asphalt, such as rutting and heat resistance, elasticity, and tensile strength. I was also to ha happy to hear uh, last year that Marcel Uber from Syncraft is, has started to pilot the use of biochar in warm mix asphalt. And in the U.S., it's been shown that biochar derived from algae um, can also improve the aging in asphalt. What I'd like to note is that Marcel's research showed that it doesn't take very much biochar to create a carbon negative road, or at least a carbon neutral road. I think he found that adding only 2% by volume created a carbon neutral road. The potential here really is huge. Carbon core has tested up to 30 tons per kilometer of road and up to 10 tons that amount in the subsurface below the asphalt. All of this depends on the cost of biochar, of course, but they have tested many different types of biochar from different feedstocks and different production technologies, and they found the benefits go beyond carbon sequestration. They're looking into getting certification, but I expect this is going to take some more time uh, through folks like Carbon Future and, um, and Puro. They are working with the city of Perth, who is particularly interested in creating net sequestering roads, which I think is a great sign uh, for the industry, but also to create carbon neutral cities. There's another uh, company noted here in the bottom right hand corner called Carbon City Connections. They are a U.S. startup that has been prototyping the use of lightweight uh, cinder blocks and patio furniture. Uh, they will need to get uh, certification to use these in buildings, but so far the results have been very promising. Another area where a biochar has been used to great effect in hardscape is in permeable pavements where it can be blended with gravel for improved infiltration and filtration of fil toxins coming off roads or roofs. The Stockholm Biochar Project has proven this concept over the past five years, and we're now starting to see it replicated around Scandinavia and hopefully soon around the globe. Uh, 
I was mentioning to Nicholas before the call started that Hans Peter and I will be working with the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance to develop uh, what they call a bioenergy biochar opportunity assessment, where we will be looking at the available feedstocks in an urban environment, the currently available technologies to turn that into biochar, what types of uses are available within an urban environment, what the overall potential for uh, impacting their decarbonization strategies is, and then what the uh, cost benefit might be uh, on the economic side. In contrast to hardscape, softscape includes all the natural living elements within the landscape, such as plants, trees, soils, etc. Planting trees, as you probably know, with biochar gives them a boost in terms of disease resistance, and it has been shown to improve survivability against the ever-increasing onslaught of pests and diseases. We first started seeing this again in Stockholm, but I know people like um, Gerald Dunst has been implementing this in Austria with great effect. One thing I've witnessed on my own building project over the past few months is that topsoil is often scraped away to make way for buildings and what remains is damaged by heavy equipment. Adding biochar into the landscape after construction is one way to improve soil properties such as water and nutrient holding capacity. So if you plan to plant a lawn, this will go a long way to helping you have a nice lawn. It can also improve compacted soils, which is um, pretty common in my part of the world. A final area that I think offers huge carbon sink potential is what I'll call waterscape. That is elements within a residential or urban landscape that are dedicated to managing water, whether there's too little or too much of it. In my recent home building adventures, I've learned a lot about the amount of earth moved um, in the name of water management. And I think utilizing biochar can offer benefits well beyond carbon sinks here. So here are a few um, uh, areas where it can be used. Um, water line trenches, I don't have that picture on this slide, but it's coming up. Um, so in my part of the world, you have to dig water line trenches below the frost line, which means it's, um, let's see, a meter and a half deep, more or less. And state regulations call for hauling in sand if you have rocky soils to protect the water lines when the trenches are refilled. Using about a third of a meter of biochar instead would have sequestered, in my situation, seven tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. And it may potentially provide some thermal insulation as well, which means you may not have to dig quite as deep if you have this thermal buffering capacity. Understanding, understanding if shallower trenches could be built is, is an open question though. I considered whether to add more than this uh, to my electrical trench, but given that there are some electromagnetic properties of certain kinds of biochar, I decided not to do that so that I can still have functioning electricity and internet. Uh, leach fields can also um, benefit from biochar. Many construction sites require building a leach field or perhaps even wetlands to treat sewage generated on site if they can't connect to the municipal wastewater treatment. And in this case, often huge amounts of sand are imported to improve the soil's adsorption capacity in the leach field. And while sand can help with certain types of physical filtration, using biochar can help with the chemical filtration and adsorption. It would be well worth getting standards in place to include the use of biochar in leach beds. I didn't have that for my current project, so I had to create a workaround. And what I ended up doing is creating a deeper trench than required so that I could put biochar at the bottom of it. I have a picture of that coming up. As folks like Chuck Hegbert and the University of Delaware researchers have demonstrated, biochar can also aid in stormwater management along highways. This is similar to what the Stockholm Biochar Project had previously shown within compacted urban 
environments. On a smaller, more residential scale, you can use this in drip line. You'll see that on the left-hand side um, or in dry creeks or rain gardens or swales. On a larger scale, adding biochar next to parking lots and roadways can significantly increase water infiltration and filtration, reducing the burden of volume and contaminants on nearby, nearby waterways or wastewater treatment facilities. What, I, what I've done here was actually something for a presentation I gave yesterday uh, for a group of uh, biochar folks in India. And what I'm trying to explain here is what some of the biochar markets are for non-agricultural uses. And this is really just a U.S. perspective. And the way to read this is that the volume column is talking about the potential relative volume of biochar that could be sold into that market. Uh, and then the value is basically what the price is that you might be able to, to get for that. Readiness is how, how close to doing this are we? Uh, and, and it's important to understand from a pricing perspective what materials you're displacing by using the biochar. And then what benefits uh, are we talking about? Obviously, carbon sequestration is a big one, but it's usually got to be more than just that. So again, on the asphalt side, I see this as uh, being able to store a huge amount of biochar, but you're probably not going to get too, too much money for that biochar because what you're often displacing here is, is fairly cheap and sometimes free. As an example of that, in states like California, they have mandated the use of recycled tires in asphalt strictly to create a market where that product can be utilized. So biochar would be competing with a product that has a very low value and is, is um, mandated legislatively. So we have a ways to go before this is going to be utilized at scale. But I think in certain countries, we're seeing that the desire to have net sequestering roads will be a key driver in getting this market up to speed. I already mentioned concrete. Um, I think that the um, the need to get this as an accepted uh, aggregate in in concrete is is critical. I will tell you we have one large gasification company being finalized right now. It should be open in the next month or so in Linden, New Jersey. They are carbonizing sewage sludge about 440 tons per day. Uh, is coming in and they are getting a very small amount. I think the reduction is something like 95% because they're really focused on the waste management side of things, but they're still gonna be generating significant tons per day of this low carbon biochar. And their first focus is to use it as a concrete additive. And, and what they're seeing is that concrete companies which have traditionally used something called fly ash, which is a byproduct from the coal production, is in diminishing supply. And it's, it's even more of a crisis here because I've been told when I was building my house that they only want fly ash from the 1980s, which was before the US Clean Air Act was instituted and the difference between the fly ash before and after is that once screening was implemented, all of the heavy metals that used to go up in the air and then back into our soils is now in the ash. And that changes its uh, function within concrete. So most concrete manufacturers do not want that kind of fly ash. They like the older stuff where it was a little bit purer, but that's in diminishing supplies. So they're looking at potentially this low carbon biochar as something that can displace that. Again, it's not going to be a very high value, but at least to have a ready market for that, I think will be very positive for these large uh, biochar institutions. The production facilities. On the composite side, I, I could probably list 50 different types of composites, but the ones that I'm most familiar with right now is in packaging materials. We're starting to see this happen a lot more. 
I mentioned a few in the building materials. I think this has the potential for high volumes. It's a non-seasonal repetitive market, which is what we need. Um, and depending on what you're displacing, if it's carbon black, that tends to be quite high value. Calcium carbonate is not as high, but still you can get a decent price if we can prove that the biochar is as efficient or at close to as efficient as the materials it's displacing. And some of the benefits I've mentioned here, um, having lighter weight packaging is, is obviously a good thing downstream because it's it less um, in transportation and whatnot. Um, I, I put filtration in here just for my <laughs> presentation yesterday and fuel cells, but I'm not going to cover that. I will say, and, and a few of you on this call probably know this already, that the, the carbon market situation is changing rapidly and I think has the potential to radically change the way uh, that the economics work within the biochar world. I, I don't know that I'm going to cover it right now, but I'd certainly be willing to answer any questions if you have any. So. I wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about my own personal journey. Um, as much as I am a huge biochar fan, when I started thinking about sequestering carbon in many forms for my house, um, I, I, I beyond using it in plasters, it was it was a little difficult. I, I've since now talked to people that are working on putting it in drywall in the concrete blocks that I showed you in the lumber, but those are still in prototype. So for me, I ended up using straw bales, uh, which in this case took about one hectare of land to produce in one year. It's a byproduct from wheat production. Um, and it's got a very high um, insulation value. I, I have turned some of the exterior wood that I used in the in the angled part of the house into a, what looks like biochar. So this is an ancient uh, Japanese technique called shosiguban. And I didn't do it in the most environmentally friendly way because I had a lot to do. <clears throat> but effectively, these charred pieces of wood are turning regular rot resistant wood into a more highly weather um, resistant, rot resistant wood <clears throat> quite naturally. Um, I, I mentioned that I put water, uh, biochar in my water trenches and in the lower right hand side, you'll see this was our very first attempt at doing this. Um, it was kind of naive, but I, I had a local Mennonite crew that was very interested in helping me figure this out. So we just basically took a, a super sack and and let the biochar run out of the bottom hole there and ran it up our, our trench line. Some other ways I'm sequestering carbon is trying not to use drywall. As I mentioned, this is a very high embodied carbon material. So instead of that, <clears throat> I've been using wood, old wood, new wood. So you'll see here some old barn wood that I recycled, some fence wood that I recycled, that's the white stuff, and then some new um, sustainably harvested pine wood in the middle there. Um, I also used um, my little biochar kiln there to carbonize some of the excess materials I had, not the composite lumber, but anything that was pure, or you'll see um, <clears throat> kind of in the middle there, this is coir made from coconut husk. And that was used as a layer beneath the plaster to to um, to allow the plaster to adhere better where I had wood on the exterior. Uh, even in my basement, I don't know if you can see, but in the upper left hand corner, these blocks are are actually, um, I think, a Swiss design. It's been around for 50 or 60 years, they told me, but I got it in Canada. This is made from 80 percent wood waste and then the rest is uh concrete and, and you pour concrete down the middle to stabilize it, but it, it has a, a high level of insulation compared to typical concrete blocks. And then I also used, uh, you can see a truck at the bottom there, I used about half a ton of cellulose insulation uh, that's made from recycled newspapers. It's, um, I did end up using many different types of insulation, but I was quite interested in the story that the cellulose insulation uh, uh, 
uh, company told me about, you know, how, how much carbon they can sequester using this type of insulation. And then I mentioned earlier, I used some biochar in my drip line irrigation uh, uh, next to the house, which helps to wick the water away. Uh, there's a little picture there. Uh, I've started using biochar in resin to create um, outlets for my electric covers. I'm working with a company uh, that produces what looks like a resin, but it's a, a concrete uh, material that will be making my countertops using biochar and this material is called deco rock so it should have that in the next month or two so those are just a few ways i have one more slide here i think that covers the septic system that i discussed and i wrote a, a more explicit article for the biochar journal that you can read uh, but this is this was a really interesting process for me. I traded uh, biochar for <clears throat> some consulting services with the largest US biochar company called National Carbon Technologies. And they shipped me uh, six super sacks of biochar. Uh, interestingly, the shipping cost was you know, quite significant, which is why I'm a big proponent of locally produced biochar or even on-site biochar. But this was a high carbon biochar made from forest, um, sustainably harvested forests. Um, <clears throat> and and what, I, what we did here, again, I worked with my civil engineer who designed the septic system. I spoke to him about the use of biochar and to be honest, uh, his eyes were rolling. <laughs> I think he didn't take me seriously, but by the end of the period where he was designing it, it was obvious that he'd looked up biochar and he was then telling me how to use it legally because as I mentioned, it's, it's not quite accepted yet. There's no best management practice, it's not approved. But he said, if we dig deeper than his plans called for and put the biochar in the trench before we put the gravel, then nobody would be the wiser and this would be a better system. I, I think I may have mentioned or not that I live across the street from a lake. So I was very concerned about leaching into the lake and behind me is a farm that has cattle and you know all sorts of things. So I was really interested. Um, so the design of the system was to have five long trenches in parallel. They were about 20 meters long and maybe a meter deep. And so we ended up putting, I don't know if it's, uh, sorry, my metric conversion isn't so good, but we put about four inches of uh, biochar at the bottom. Normally, as I said, you just put gravel. So there's not a lot of filtering that happens. It just comes out of these pipes into the gravel and then right into the soil, which I think personally is a little crazy. So we, we figured out a way to get this into the system. And I have to say the, the uh, excavator's comment was, this is too pretty to cover up, but we did cover it up. As you can see, what we did here is we, we laid a few uh, um, hills of the gravel and then we laid the uh, pipes across that and then they filled in with the gravel and on top of that was topsoil after they put this layer of geotextile and that's basically to prevent the gravel from getting clogged by the sand and topsoil. <clears throat> so uh, I probably used about a ton <clears throat> uh, in the trenches. I could have used a lot more, but I'm saving it for some other uses. My plan is to use some on the top in a grid fashion so I can, you know, do some more um, experience, experiments that will be easier to, to uh, follow up on the results here. I'm not really going to be able to follow up on too much because it's, it's uh, a meter below the surface. So... Okay, I think that is where I got to, uh, Nicholas. I'm happy to take any questions or go deeper into any of those topics that I mentioned. Um, I, I can see a couple of questions already. I don't know if I see them all or just a subset. Yes, so first of all, uh, Kathleen, thank you very much for this very wide ranging and very cool uh, talk. Thanks a lot. Yes, you've seen um, you've seen the questions from Georg of uh, Geisenheim University. 
who's also found this presentation really impressive and he wanted to know um, if you did an overall mass balance of how much carbon you sequestered in your new home. <laughs> I wish. First of all, let me say that I I am not a life cycle assessment expert, but I have kept track of all the materials that I've been using. So if someone wants to help me with that in, in a few months time, I would love it. Um, but yeah, that, that's that's a job in and of itself. Um, what I found really interesting was, you know, it's it's a challenge to convince people to do things differently, at least in my part of the world. And and here's just one example. So I sourced these great bricks for my basement. And the first mason I called basically said, that's a terrible idea. Let me talk you out of it and I'll help you with what I can do. <laughs> so it was really difficult. You know, each step of the way you'd think, OK, this is easy. But, it, it, you know, it's a lot of work um, to, to convince people. Yeah, I guess this experience is not limited to the US. It's, I think it's uh, quite quite the same here from my experience working on our home. Yeah. Um, okay, so that the mass balance uh, needs uh, needs to be done. Will be interesting. Um, be interesting to see. And we have uh, uh, Zana of, of, of German Biotech Associations. She says, um, "All the thanks here a lot for the for the presentation." Um, and she would love to hear more about the uh, concrete in um, the Search Lodge concrete project that you that you okay. mentioned. If you could provide any um, reference for us, she would be grateful. Yeah, it's actually pretty public information so far. The company is a U.S. technology company called Aries A R. IES clean energy. Sometimes they're called Aries green energy. Uh, I, I will um, follow up with Nicholas, uh, but if you just Google them, you'll see their first plant was in Tennessee and they have been operating for quite a while. They uh, blended municipal solid waste and wood waste and really had a hard time finding a buyer for that kind of on uh, inconsistent biochar. Um, so they ended up in that plant just going with wood waste. And now they produce a really consistent, high quality um, biochar. But then they really saw the opportunity in the in the sewage sludge world. And so they had this multi-million dollar plant going up uh, in New Jersey. It's been in process for quite a while. Um, COVID slowed it down a little bit, but I was just talking to one of the engineers a month or so ago, and they are pretty focused on the use of uh, concrete, it, using it in concrete. But obviously, as with any situation, you really have to get the machine turned on, making biochar, tested for what's in it, and then tested in the different recipes. So they have a, a letter of understanding with the concrete manufacturer, but they really need to to go a bit further. I've also had conversations with the same company about testing it in asphalt because I think it might be a really good material for that. So, so that being said, I had a, a very interesting conversation with a Danish company that is in the same sewage sludge pyrolization and they showed me their uh, labs from the sewage sludge biochar and, and it was really good. It was low carbon, 22 to 30 percent, but it was not toxic at all and it had really high nutrients so part of me says we should still be testing that for potential uses in soils um or or non-construction materials but i think we we have to do a little bit more research on that yeah it would be a follow-up question for uh, from my side on that what do they do about um the phosphate in 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 carbonized suits such because that's what i know the people that I talk to about concrete is that the concrete people, they don't like phosphates at all. Well, this is why I say it really depends on the type of biochar, um, because I don't mm -hmm. think, you know, we, we tend to just gloss over the, the nuances. But this person I mentioned in, in um, Singapore, he's been looking at what does pH impact within concrete and, and what does some other characteristics of it because I think we are not nuanced enough to really know that. One thing I had seen when I was looking at the literature is that biochars with high silica um, can be very good. Uh, so rice husk biochar, uh, some of the other ones seem to have high silica content and then it has a kind of pozzolanic 
um, impact on concrete. So, so I think the, the jury's still out on, on what are the best biochars to put in certain kinds of concrete. And phosphorus is just one of those things. We, we shouldn't be wasting that, in my opinion. Okay, so you so they just go for about about the feedstock selection. They don't do specific technologies to remove phosphate because that's a larger topic here. Yeah, I'd have to ask them if they are. Um, that's a whole other technology. It it would make sense, but I don't know, you know, how cost effective that is. And and uh, but I'll I'll follow up with Aries on that. The other company I was mentioning is aqua green in denmark uh, very interesting they they just announced they have two other plants being built in denmark so mm -hmm. uh, just um then i'll uh, get back to the question in a second i'll just um highlight uh, the question of uh ben and power Evert because that fits here is the, which additional sources and processes do you see in providing amounts of biochar for building materials i mean we've covered the sewage sludge we've covered, uh, so like the on-site paralysis of wood from demolitions. Or what else do you have on your roadmap or in your mind? You mentioned yeah, algae as well. Um, yeah, I mean, in Bern, Albert and I talked about the potential for converting algae and, and other ocean biomass into biochar. It, it's huge as long as you can deal with the, the salt issue. Obviously, you know, <laughs> that, that, that causes some downstream impacts. Um, but yeah, I'm not personally focusing on that. One of the things I'm really very interested in now is the whole composites industry. So uh, years ago, I'd written about um, putting it in, in what I call chartboard. Uh, and there's now a paper company in the U.S. that's very interested in that because they're losing markets for newspaper um, and because a lot of companies, you know, that are in this decarbonization mode are really looking how at how to reduce plastics and make something more sustainable. So I think, you know, packaging for all those packages you get from Amazon, <laughs> you know, making something that can be utilized or, or put in your compost bin would be a great solution. Um, I just wanted to see now that I have my video camera on, I, I had a couple of pictures in the <clears throat> in the slides, but here was uh, a picture of a tile used for flooring that I got from a company in Korea uh, called KD Energy. Um, they are one of the biggest biochar producers I'd ever seen. I think they make something like 30,000 tons a year. Um, it's it's a strange situation though, because they, they charge an awful lot for the biochar and they didn't end up making this in an economically viable fashion. So they're no longer doing that. Um, but the other company I had mentioned is America Sierra. They're not far from me actually. I think they are still only in the prototype phase, but they're making these composites with plastics and other waste and biochar through an extrusion process. Here's another one. This was a uh, lumber. I have another one somewhere that has electronic waste in it. I don't know if you can see that, but there's some metallic, oops, sorry, uh, waste in there. And then- And that is, sorry, this, this is, what is the purpose of this, of this material? So what they are looking at is, is composite lumber for outdoor uses. And then this one is kind of a con uh, countertop material. It's super lightweight. I think the first market they were looking at this was for recreational vehicles, trailers, because um, you need a lightweight material for that sort of thing. Um, and then I, I lost it. Um, <laughs> I, I think a lot of you have already seen my plaster uh, uh, shot shot glasses, which um, have different types of biochar in different varieties. This has 40% biochar, 20% eggshell, and the rest is is concrete. So, um, yeah. So, but this is probably only for, for trivial filtered vodka, because then you give the fourth purification step. <laughs> yeah. What, what Albert and I noticed is you have to drink fast out of those things because they absorb very quickly. And then another thing we mentioned in Burn, but I'll just show you a copy. This is from uh, a biochar friend of mine in Canada who's an environmental engineer, and he uses uh, phytoremediation to absorb heavy metals around landfills. And so those trees obviously have some amount of 
metals in them. That's the purpose. And then when you turn them into biochar, those metals are even more concentrated. So it may not be that they pass the test for use in soils because of the heavy metal content. So he's been looking at making it into um, bricks and uh, drywall and things like that. It, it hasn't gone commercial. He's, he's just kind of playing around with this, but he's also spoken to people in South Africa that are doing similar things. And, you know, there's a lot of what I call the DIY movement, the do-it-yourselfers that are testing things. I would really like to see it step up and, and become much more commercialized. And if you would, and if you want to go into drywall, that also would be on a gypsum base or what would be the binder here? Well, he used plaster as the binder, as far as I understand. Um, and, mm -hmm. and interestingly, the same uh, size drywall is about the same weight. So it didn't really do much in terms of um, lightening it up. And, and what I will say is my, my experience with just the, uh, sorry, I'm moving around here, um, with just the charred board that has maybe 10% biochar is that it, it already has electromagnetic shielding properties, which is good in some situations and not in others. So I, I am not having that in my house, in the walls, because I was worried about it, you know, preventing signals from getting into my office and things like that. So. Yeah, it'd be a shame if we don't reach you anymore. <laughs> well, that might not be a bad thing. I might get more done that way. <laughs> yeah, always, always find the balance. Um, yeah, so now we'd like to get back to Georg's question. Uh, would a natural wastewater treatment pond producing uh, phragmitis or phragmitis, I'm sorry if I mispronounce this, or REED be feasible as a septic system? So maybe... Uh, uh, in addition to that question, you could give a bit more background on your septic system. So that means you have to treat all your wastewater on site. Yeah, so the way a septic system works here is you have a tank right next to your house. So all of the stuff from your toilets and washing machine and all that goes into this tank. And, and it basically settles the solids. Uh, and, but the water, which still has some particles in it, flows out through a, um, what do they call it, uh, a diversion tank. And that diversion tank will equally put the, the effluent to the five drain fields. OK, normally and the size of the drain field depends on the size of your house, the, the type of soil that you have. I have very compacted soils, so it was a larger than some places, but it's a small house, so it's smaller than many. Um, so because of the compacted soils, that tells you what kind of a septic system you'll have. And mine's what you call a raised bed, even though they had to dig down, they had to bring in. 200 tons of sand to help water get into the uh, system and, and and work its way down. But the sewage sludge itself or, or the effluent is just hitting the gravel normally. That's That's crazy to me because then it just goes right without filtering anything into your subsoil and then gets into the groundwater. So my thinking here was Let's put something below the gravel level. I think we could also mix the sand and the biochar above it, but that's where it wasn't going to pass the, the inspection if I did that. So once the inspection was done, now I can do whatever I want and I can put some on top of it so that I can see, you know, what kind of difference it might have in terms of, you know, drought um, resistance or, you know, things like that. Okay, that means if you all so all your all micropollutants are accumulated in everybody's backyard uh, in your in your neighborhood because um, you all you discard everything on your on your own land. And so yes, on we the when you can't hook up to public systems, yeah, yeah, yeah. and usually you have your septic tank. Um, vacuumed out every few years, but the drain fields, unless they fail, are not um, touched. The, the interesting thing, which I wrote about in the Biochar Journal article on this, was that in places like uh, Long Island, they have to rebuild over 350,000 septic systems and the 
before septic systems, we had cesspools, which were even less in terms of filtration. They have to dig them up and replace them because they're all leaching nutrients into the Long Island Sound and other water bodies, which is killing off the fish, leading to eutrophication. So they've set aside billions of dollars to do this. Um, but I think what we need to be talking to them about is the advantage, not just of cleaner water, but, you know, how can this impact your waste management practices out there, as well as your, your carbon sequestration goals? You know, I think it's a, a triple win. Yeah, the end is a... Is there also a discussion going on? Is there a discussion to uh, separate wastewater uh, for your um, kitchen wastewater and for your toilet wastewater? So these are called gray water systems in English. Um, I'm not doing that yet. Eventually, I hope so. But th that's... Um yeah, <laughs> it's not very common here yet. Uh, so again, I got to go find somebody who, who knows what they're doing. Um, and yeah, but I, I set in place a way that that can be implemented. It's the same way as I don't have solar panels right now. I want to live in it for a year, understand what my demand is, and then and then use it. Same thing with the, the gray water. I, I don't tend to use a lot of things that are really toxic, um, but it, it is a uh, yeah, ideal. We also don't have water shortages here. We're, we have a lot of water here. So it's not something in Florida, gray water systems are quite common because they have more issues with drought. Yeah. And so getting back to the next question about um, using uh, treatment ponds, is that common or discussed in, in the U.S.? Yeah, so that's more common for a business. It's not very common for uh, residential. I don't even know that it's legal at a residential level, but you do often hear about these wetlands. Um, Phragmites is one of them. Phragmites is great, I think, as a feedstock for making the biochar. Uh, as long as you can harvest it, that seems to be a bit of a challenge. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not uncommon. It's, it's just more for larger scale. Yep. Uh, and so these is, these are have been the questions from from our chat here. I would have another uh, uh, question from my side, just an idea that came during your your talk. Did you ever think about using um, um, gypsum in the pyrolysis? So if you have the um, the drywall uh, discarded drywalls and mixing them with wood and have a uh, have a kind of a co-pyrolysis to have some i mean the downside would be to have the the sulfur probably in the in in the exhaust but you could have the the calcium in in your in your biochar which could have some uh, positive effect on the pyrolysis and the char that's new to me i i've never thought about it it would be interesting to talk to the construction and demolition recycling association about that uh, is anyone doing that already? No, it's not, it's not to my knowledge, no one is, is doing that. It's just like that there's a number of uh, scientific activity about using additives in the pyrolysis. It started from the UK Biochar Research Center on using wood ash. And if, and where, for example, I started diving into that topic. And so there's various, can be various benefits or at least possibilities to steer the pyrolysis process by using um potassium or calcium and and some other um earth or metal, uh, metals interesting yeah uh, no i've never thought of it more space uh for further for further discussion and projects mm -hmm. great it was a, a very uh very um very interesting insights into your house and all the other construction activities in the us i'd like to thank you very much um, for all of this, and um, yes, uh, the people here will be read more from you uh, indirectly through the German version of Bern. And so, yeah, finally, ah, oh, there's the final question. Are you already living in your house? <laughs> Is this in the background? Is this what hmm? you wish? <laughs> I wish. No, uh, actually, COVID has really disrupted the. Uh, supply chain within the building industry. And I waited six months to get my windows, which just arrived last Friday. So they're in. Um, but uh, yeah, building materials have gone up 50% over here. It's crazy. So I don't know that I chose the right time. But also, since I couldn't travel for work, I guess it was a good time to build a house.
Yeah, so fingers crossed that you get uh, make the final steps within the next couple of weeks. Good luck for this. And uh, yeah, once more, thank you very much for a great talk and a nice discussion. Okay. And hope to see you soon. All right. Thanks, Nicholas. Goodbye. Ihnen allen vielen herzlichen Dank fürs äh, Zuhören. Auch diesen Vortrag werden wir bald ähm, auf YouTube zum Nachhören äh, vorstellen. Und damit wünsche ich Ihnen allen noch einen wunderschönen guten Abend. Auf Wiedersehen.